Welcome to episode 41 of the Hard Truth About B2B E-Commerce. I'm your co-host, Isaiah Bollinger, and I'm here with Tim. It uh, feels like it's been a while, Tim. <laughs> you know, it, it feels like it was, but it's because I did an episode and then you did, you know, so we had a little uh, bit of a and then, break. Yeah, we, we missed an episode too, or I was I was on uh, my birthday break, so. You were on your birthday break, <laughs> and, and you know, now that you're 21, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish I, I could wish. go back to that time. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's great to be back, and, uh, you know, uh, hello again to all of our listeners. We're so happy to be here uh, to the hard truth about B2B e-commerce. And uh, let me tell you just a little bit about our sponsor, uh, Punch Out To Go. They are a global B2B integration company specializing in connecting commerce business platforms with e-procurement and ERP applications. Punch Out To Go's iPass technology seamlessly links business applications to automate the flow of purchasing data. With their solution, you can immediately reduce integration complexities for Punch Out catalogs, electronic purchase orders, invoices, and other B2B sales order automation documents to accelerate your business results. Thank you once again to our sponsor. And uh, Isaiah, I'm going to throw it back to you. I'm really excited about today's guest. Yeah, Uh, absolutely. Um, Sometimes uh, it's hard to get, uh, get, uh, you know, people like Dan and and customers that you know on, but we're excited to uh, to finally be able to bring on Dan from Staples. Um, So Dan, you you know, you've been been there for a while and have a long uh, background in, in e-commerce and brand and brand development, product development. Um, and I'm sure that goes beyond your time at Staples. So um, tell us a little bit about your career and kind of how that's related to, to B2B e-commerce over the years. Yeah. So I guess um, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the fast version. So uh, <laughs> I, I went to school and I, I focused on uh, industrial design, product design. And I, I went into product design called consulting right out of school, right in, right in Cambridge, Mass, uh, at, a, at a small consultancy that uh, really focused on high tech electromechanical systems and things like that. And I enjoyed it. I liked it. But I didn't, I didn't have a lot of interaction with customers using the products other than customer testing. And I yeah. never really knew where things were going. So my, uh, my goal was to get involved where I could have interaction and feedback from, from customers. Um, so I went to a, a startup. Uh, and with, with two other two other guys, and um, we grew a uh, you know a small startup uh, to uh, you know selling housewares and, and rechargeable lighting, um, and it you know we grew it you know by uh, I guess uh, uh, a lot of gift store sales, uh, yep. so we did trade shows and things like that. But we did start our own website at that time. Went through like a NetSuite integration and, and whatnot. Oh, wow. Uh, way back, um, this is the early years. days of NetSuite, or this is this must have been early NetSuite. It was or? very. I mean, this is uh, very early two thousands. So, uh, wow. It was. Uh, it was. Uh, you know, it was challenging transition, but um, you know, our our website worked really well because customers, you know, were passionate about our products. We had fans of the products, huh. and you had an easy following. So it was kind of the before social media really really took over. It was kind of the beginning of that D to C kind of relationship and you could build yep. this really strong relationship and met w- what many of them have today is this scaling issue. They yep. build the relationship, but they eventually have to go to retail partners just to really distribute their products. Yep. And we kind of experienced that same thing. Uh, and eventually, um, you know, that the, the IP on the company was sold and, and whatnot. And we kind of moved on because it was just too, too much to sustain. So that was my uh, kind of early um, experience. E-commerce. And I'd say, you know, one of the challenges there B two B at the time was that everything was through fact sheets, and uh, it yeah. was through. Um, you know, we did Netsuite actually did have a order platform that you could have your vendors kind of order direct from mm-hmm. us. And sure. That was really helpful because we had we focused on gift stores, so there were there were thousands of them just placing orders in, and they were small yeah. orders, and it, it became hard to process. So that was really a great integration for us. Um, but anyway, after that, I ended up going to, I went, I went to business school cause I was like, I'm never going to work this hard again and, and have to, you know, move on. Uh, but went to business school and felt that a bigger company would be a great way to learn while I was in school. And I, I landed at Staples and I've done various roles, uh, since I've been there. Um, and you know, Staples has been, uh, has, has a lot of, you know, the, the thing that you always say is like, you learn every day there. Uh, because the business is so large that you find these niches and areas that are that are just really uh, interesting. Most of my time, or actually all my time, has been spent uh, in the own brand group. So we're about a, a four billion dollar portfolio of own products that we go source, manufacture, and then bring into the fold at Staples. Yep. And then and then you know 
bring them into the, um, you know, the, the e-commerce platforms and, and then they really try to help drive their success there. So uh, I've been doing do you guys, that. Do you guys ever distribute those to other distributors or you're the distributor, you're the retailer, you're the manufacturer? We I mean, do. So we do, we do distribute to other retailers. So we've actually, um, la about last year, a little, little before that, we started to really scale that out now. Um, I actually started um, with a, with a couple of folks at Staples, the um, Staples selling our own brand products on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and we grew that, um, me, myself and a, and a small team grew that uh, to about two and a half million dollars in sales. Uh, and then we handed it off to another team that would, would, would scale. But we were really proving the concept that yeah. it was essentially a different customer there. And we're actually not hurting ourselves by not participating we're hurting yeah. ourselves by not participating because we're not yeah. introducing yeah. you know the customer to you're to not cannibalizing companies. by going on like no not really it, it just doesn't it, it's just a different customer base you know yeah. what i found is that customers tend to love an experience and the staples experience for a be a business is much different than a consumer experience in an for amazon sure. So you you kind of want to participate where if you can if you can figure out a way to participate in those different experiences as a product seller the way we are in the own brand group you really benefit from reaching the customers in different ways. So so I'm going to just interject for a second yeah. because you you brought up something that I know we're going to be talking about in other parts but but really just you bringing up Amazon this early you know I've got to I got to bring it out there I'm glad to, to emphasize for our listeners you know, the experience piece, because that's something that we've often, uh, you know, heard on the podcast from others is that, you know, you, you, you should be out on Amazon to an extent, like almost everybody should be out there for a lot of different reasons, for volume, for learning, you know, for a lot of different things. However, you know, if you have a brand, especially one as big and as well known as Staples, it's the experience, you know, that you can't yeah. duplicate you know, through the Amazon platform. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, as a, as someone in this business, I try, I'll try anything. I, I try not to try the shadiest websites, but I, I'll try. I like to try different ones. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll divide my purchases between Target, Walmart and figure out how they're advancing and always watching my own experience on different tools that they're, that they're changing. So if you're not, if you're not doing that, like, I mean, it might cost you uh, like the cost change between these. They track each other and crawl the web for pricing most of the time. I'm talking the stuff you buy every day, like, you know, home goods and things like that. So I try, you know, I'll order food from Instacart, uh, Amazon's Whole Foods, Amazon's Fresh. Like try to, I try all the different ones and figure out the unique, um, the unique differences just because all those experience cues can, can change what you might do. Yeah. Um, I think um, it's changing so fast right now that uh, I, I don't know, it's kind of a hobby to just try. Yeah, to it really is. It really is amazing. So speaking of that experience, and I think that's something that in some ways we haven't talked enough about, I think, you know, we've been trying to kind of like educate and help the B2B e-commerce market. Cause especially these like, smaller companies that aren't as, you know, largest staples, some of them are just starting out with B2B e-commerce and they, I don't think they realize how important that experience is to grow their business in B2B. Yeah. I think, you know, so you can so, talk about that from like an experience mm -hmm. standpoint and yeah. like just. You know. Yeah. So I think just, just to take a step back, you know, when staples started, um, you know, way back to founding, our, our chief merchandising officer just posted a, a, a founding, uh, a, a note on LinkedIn about uh, Tom Stenberg, our founder, and he had an image of the store and it said, we take orders by phone. And that was kind of, that's how B2B, e, e, it's like ear commerce. Yeah, online, <laughs> B2B, yeah. It used to happen over the phone. Then it was like fax orders. You know, we were, when I started Sables, we were still doing a huge catalog with, with you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, you know, uh, you know, object, you know, catalogs going out. And, and that became kind of how people operated. And, and there's a reason for it. <laughs> um, it was incredibly efficient for the customers. So, you know, it, it, it you want to make sure what you're delivering to them is something that, that really works. If, you know, for us, there's a lot of reorder you know, a very high percentage of what we sell is reorder. So reorder and making efficient reorder is extremely, you have to make sure that's extremely streamlined as an example. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't, when you're saying, thinking, um, you know, a consumer e-commerce, it's a very different approach because reorder, you don't order the same, you know, 
shirt and pair of pants over and over and over yeah. again. But, but a business you, you might do. order a thousand pair of pants for their thousand employees. So that reorder really needs to be seamless. Yeah. And you almost want to be able to read the minds of what, when the person needs it and yeah. time it. And there's, there's nuances to what we do there to make sure that, you know, we, we notice a cadence and then, you know, you'll, you'll make sure that you can do things um, uh, according to that. Um, you know, from a uh, experience standpoint, B2B for us too, is our business is grouped in many different sections. So uh, I don't want to get into the details of a, of a segmentation, but um, you'll see that, uh, you know, different size businesses behave differently. So understanding that is, is, a, is key. So just a, a high level example is an enterprise size company that is, uh, you know, a billion dollars in sales likely has someone that negotiates their contract. Then there's users of that account. Um, that use the Staples account, and then there's receivers of those products. <laughs> so the stream for me between the person that actually decides to be a Staples customer and then actually gets the product, it's it's a very long. You it's know, a complicated. Uh, it's a complicated mex- mechanism. The simplified yeah, you, is like you have a negotiator, contract person, then you have you know users and people. Uh, uh, procurement department and then you have people like oh i got this shirt and now i need to wear it or <laughs> yeah and i'm on the, i'm on the other end like i'm on the other end of it so i receive services so so trellis is a company that i work with but also other you know platforms that we subscribe to uh, online yeah. trend platforms things like that yeah. and oftentimes when the sales team and the team working with you to establish the account is different than what the experience is it kind of falls apart and that yeah. actually happens quite a bit. So one, one tip is to make sure that as you go in and you're building these relationships, you can actually fulfill it on the back end. And, the, and I'll tell you, the teams that do it the best or the companies that do it the best with me, and this is really what, what Staples wants to do as well, is that when you go in and you build the relationship, you understand where it's starting from a B2B standpoint, you then want to make sure that team that's going to manage and, and deal with the day-to-day on a regular basis is there and integrated and understands how to, you know, that, that all the commitments are being made and how everything flows uh, through the system. So I think for me, that's a big, big piece is to make sure all those pieces uh, work well together. So, so I like how you brought it down and like at a billion dollar company level, you have this certain kind of experience and I can imagine from an online experience, you have like a company account and multiple users. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, and I think a lot of the B2B platforms are, are doing more of that in e-commerce. Um, but what, do you see a difference in the smaller customers? Like as you go down, you know, the mid-market customers, maybe they don't need quite as much of that. Uh, their expectations are different. Do they, do you build certain simpler features for them or what, what have you yeah, seen for like, I, a, I'd say, like a trellis, um, you know, we're not quite a billion dollar company. So what we buy stuff, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, for me, the, the we thing do is buy what, stuff from office, we do buy office supplies. So yeah, I think the, the smaller companies just, you know, you have to have your door open in many different ways. So if it's a very small established company, that's maybe a manufacturer that's been making a very you know high tech part, but they're in business for a long period of time they might not want to change from what they've been doing. So you kind of have to adapt to what, what the way that they want to work or, you, or it's going to be a heavy barrier. So if you're very tech focused and, and you have a customer base that may not be as tech focused, then you might have to adapt and, and lean in and make things a little bit easier for them or accept orders in, in a different way. And, and yeah. So I think so, you have to think about that. On the other end, you know, there are um, companies that just want to do it all themselves. Uh, and you have to be able to create a platform for them to basically kind of DIY their solution uh, and say, this is how we want to control permissions. This is how we want to control everything. And they kind of go in uh, and we'll, we'll kind of set that up on their own. Uh, and so, you got to, but you got to be, it's the same thing. You still, will still accept a fax order. <laughs> like you don't want to turn away uh, someone that wants to order the way they want to order. So I, I guess my quick you know, distinction there is that, you know, in some of the conversations we've had, uh, a lot of people say that small business really acts a lot more like B2C, right? And, and that's something that, that I've personally seen as well, where a small business may want to have, you know, buy online, pick up in store, or even curbside pick up at, you know, at a retail location. But the biggest, biggest orders, that's not going to be practical necessarily for, you know, a lot of B2B players to do something like that. So do you kind of look at that model yeah, that way as well? well yeah, definitely. So we we treat like under 10, it's about eight to 10 under that number. Um, about when you get to about eight or 10, it starts to change a little bit. So lower eight or 10 than employees. Really, yeah. Yeah. 10 people in the business. Okay. 
So that generally tends to be there. I wouldn't, you know, I think um, trellis, I wouldn't consider <laughs> small. <laughs> um, I think they're, you know, they're, they're not the, they're, that's, they don't behave like a consumer. Yeah. Them. We're definitely past that level for yeah. sure. So, so you like the, that the, eight, think, the sub 10, yeah. you treat almost similar to a consumer purchase. Yeah. And then usually there's a single approver. There's one person that makes the buying and they kind of make the yeah. buying. And maybe they get a slight discount because they're a business. Is that? Yeah. And I think the thing about, you know, there it it's, you know, B2B in that platform, um, what you're trying to do is graduate them to programs that can actually benefit them. Cause if you get to certain programs, you'll get more support and it relieves some of the administrative burden of, of procuring your things. So I think, you know, Trellis is an example, as we went through the pandemic, we started to create, uh, we had a lot of, we just kind of <laughs> pivoted and started creating these, um, uh, accommodating these stipend programs where companies wanted to give yeah. their employees, uh, you know, amount of money to set up their home office or to have some supplies and things at home, but they didn't want to tell them, create a package and send all the stuff that they weren't going to use or anything like that. Cause that's not yeah. useful. So we have a furniture brand as an example, and this is kind of one of the places started. We basically created collections that are small, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, pamphlet size, you can communicate it very easily um, with different price points on how to outfit your space and how to make things go together, what works well together and make it really tight and easy to accommodate. And in that sense, you can then say, okay, here's a program that can solve this need and it removes burden from, you know, a, a small or medium sized company trying to figure that all out and have an office admin patch all this stuff together and kind of solve that problem. And these are the kinds of things that we'll do I mean, yeah. there's hundreds of examples like that at, at Staples where we we find these different areas because we're in so many lines of business. You're you're finding these these niches that um, really are are a need, and, and you can just adapt how you go to market um, with the with your with your product lines. How, how, how much growth do you think? Are you seeing a, a cultural shift in businesses wanting to do more self serve? Like yeah you know, hey, uh, give us our account, train us on how this platform works. But once we're set up, we just want to order and expect it to come within yeah, I think a day or whatever is, you're, yeah. Yeah, I think one thing is companies just want more and more real-time data of where their stuff is, when they're going to get it, all that kind of stuff. So like mm -hmm. the real-time data thing is just becoming like, it's it's getting to the point where like when you get your your Uber or your, you yeah. know, your Lyft and you're like you can watch it in the map. Yeah, I want to <laughs> watch like, my I chair. <laughs> I want to watch my the chair. Point where <laughs> the office popcorn is going to become that important, and you're going to want to know where it is driving to the driving to work. But like it is like clear clear data is kind of how business runs. I don't have to worry about it, and when I do worry about it, I want to know, and I want to be able to check and know. Is and that that's very very transparent. So, so I think, you know, constantly working towards that is, is something that I think um, all businesses as, um, should be focused on, especially in the B2B. So you uh, think the space. B2B space should be all, just almost as focused as the consumer space is on, on getting closer and closer to that Uber like experience. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things we have, we still have a very large sales force. And the reason we have a sales force is they, it works. And also because they service our customers so well. And when they can just pick up a phone and they know that someone's going to answer the phone and solve their problem, that's immeasurable uh, to many companies. You know, they, they can't find a higher value. And I have a problem. I'm going to call my guy that can help me solve it. And that happens to us in the ship and pack space or pack and ship. I always say pack first. Pack and ship, which is kind of, you know, boxes, void fill. And yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what you call it, tape. Like the, the U-line um, space. Is yeah, yeah. Right. so yeah. like in that space, like I got this problem uh, or I need this and, and how do I solve that quickly? So one, real-time data online can help you with that, but ultimately it's only as good as the data is and, you know, how do you get it as good as an actual human that can can go do it? And you got it, you're constantly improving that. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's just always a key because, you know, our availability of something is essentially their availability and, and the clearer we can make that to them, the better it is. So, so years ago, it, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm a lot of trouble because I've actually worked with the projects at Staples over the many years. So one of the things that, that I'll say it's 15 to 20 years ago, there was a Staples uh, experiment to uh, do custom experiences for big clients, right? And I don't I really know whatever happened with that, but at that point, what they were doing is, you know, they were creating e-commerce shops for each of those clients and allowing them to only have their selection of merch. And then each of those, you know, places 
workers could buy a, you know whatever they wanted to because that's all that was available right it was negotiated so is that something that's actually no, so that is that's, a, that's just a part of the way kind of the office supplies business has started it's called contract um, and okay. there's a contract negotiated for a discounted set of products mm-hmm. we still do that today but we have off contract and on contract sales so there is off contract product and and they can they can buy that product as well so it. it is it's both so yes i can see my filter but then i can also see things are available uh, on the outside yeah, people well. were very excited about it at that time and i just never really was sure what was going to come of it but it makes sense no I think- yeah and it works because you you're you're basically saying the highest volume stuff that i use the most i want to get i want it guaranteed because i want to understand my forward expenses as a business owner. And I'm saying, I want to manage this and this is what I know what I use. Okay, so this yeah. is solidified. And then the extraneous stuff can be a little bit more unpredictable and that that's, gives the businesses a, a good sense of- um, uh, I think there's more of that happening now in the promotional products industry, which you guys also are in too. Yes, <laughs> one of the largest. Uh, yeah, I always forget about that because- You're the yeah. largest? I didn't realize yeah. that in promotion. Yeah, quite large promotion. in the promotional. Yeah. It's a, it's a the great, I mean, it's been, you know, there was um, some challenges during the pandemic, but uh, that team's done done really a great job to, to come And around. do you compare I mean, yourself? Even changing products to actually, uh, you know, a lot of branded merchandise that uh, related to PPE versus through the-, through the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You guys probably had it. Like, now we have masks. And uh, just this is a side question, but do you guys compare yourselves to like a Vistaprint or are they considered separate from promotional products? Well, so we had, yeah, we have a copy and print division as well. So there, there is a bit of an overlap. There's kind of this weird area where it overlaps. We try to, we could, we try to divide it. Um, you know, there's okay. a certain point. Where so would you divided. not consider them promotional products? They're more prints? Like what, yeah. So we, what? we call that print and marketing. So gotcha. if I'm, if I'm, if I'm creating business cards, sales materials, that mm-hmm. kind of thing, um, that's all in that space. There is a point where it kind of overlaps where I'm getting my business set up and I want to get like a baseball cap and some coasters gotcha. or something. and yeah. like it kind of merges. So it, it is, uh, it, it does get a little switch. Cause I think they're also moving into the promo space a little bit too, where you can yeah. you know, I'll probably yeah. get like a t-shirt yeah. or something from them too. Yeah. I think it's um, just, it's, it's when you start to do it, you know, the promotional products business starts to do it at, at, at you know, big scale. More of a volume based. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. the larger businesses as well, it gets yeah. complicated. Gotcha. But yeah, we're, we've seen more of a personalized company experience around that because it's like, I think it's also just like fun for the employees. Like I get to go on my yeah, yeah, store, I mean, I think, you, know. you know. A lot of what we do is, it, the thing is when you're talking about, you know, B2B e-commerce, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of businesses that we're in that are just complicated. So you know, the janitorial, um, you know, facilities business for facilities maintenance is a, is a fairly complicated business where, you know, you got to go in and audit a building to say, you know, here's, here's the stuff that I use to clean mm. this business. How do I set up this building with, you know, janitorial products, the restroom products that, you know, with the dispensers, Yeah, that, that isn't, that is, it's a bit different than just ordering you know, yeah. a supply. And that's um, where a salesperson is probably most valuable in B2B. That, yeah. And I think there's starting to be some technology that's proving it out. Um, you know, some of the apps that are, um, you know, our, our, our leading brands uh, have provided have, have been, you know, really mm-hmm. um, uh, good tools for, for the team. Uh, I think it's just continuing to evolve though, because, you know, it, it's one of those things where every time you introduce another piece of technology, you got, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people that got to learn, have to learn how to use it, then how much are you got to be willing to maintain it and keep it up and keep doing it if you're going to go down that path. And I think, yeah. um, you know, over the years, um, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, half starts, um, uh, not on our side, but I think uh, in many cases, um, you know, across, you know, across a, a B2B, you know, uh, uh, vendors of ours that uh, just, uh, you know, they, they try something and I, I encourage them to, I think it's just, you got to try it, learn from it and just keep, keep evolving. I want to ask a wild card question and I'm going to throw it back to the ones we kind of officially were going <laughs> to you know, go through, but this just occurred to me really. It, so I'm thinking of like, where, where does Staples land on uh, social commerce, for example, for B2B, because some people have been experimenting pretty heavily in that area it's a huge deal, obviously, for B2C. B2B, I'm not so sure. So what do, what do you guys uh, do or what do you think? Well, so see, this is, I'm in the, I'm in the, um, the uh, own brand group. So I, I have a mm-hmm. little bit of a different view because, you know, when we talk about our customers, we have a, B, a business segmentation. Yeah. 
And I really care about the users of the products. So one, you know, my, the way I communicate needs to be, you know, acceptable to larger businesses. But when I'm developing a product, I got to think about the users and the users are really in these social platforms. That's where you're going to get, yeah. um, get, get feedback. So a couple of things that we're doing, True Red is our uh, own brand, um, uh, you know, office supplies kind of upgraded uh, a line of products uh, that we, we, and we've recently la launched a bunch of new things in the writing and note-taking uh, area. So we yeah. started to amplify um, social uh, there and we're starting to put in, you know, some of the key, key triggers for purchase. So you can purchase, you know, click right on the product and, and it takes you right to a place uh, to purchase it. So we're just starting to kind of scale that up here and figuring out where, where it's going. We're actually getting really good, good interaction on, on, uh, uh, from users in this space because there's just not a lot of people doing a lot, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And also we're, we're, we have a, a pretty good uh, marketing campaign going uh, related to it right now. We're doing some uh, you know, geographic testing with that in, in the Houston market. So that's pretty exciting. So too early to tell now, but we're picking up quite a few followers. We're seeing the traction. Well, which movement. platforms, if you don't mind? Uh, so we're primarily Instagram is where we're seeing a lot and Facebook is where we're mm -hmm. seeing a lot. Uh, but because we're B2B, we stood up LinkedIn and we're trying to figure out what's going to happen with LinkedIn. Um, there's not really a commerce component there right now, as, yeah. far as I, I'm aware of. But I think we're trying to figure out where that's going to go. And then um, there may be. That's my yeah. inside scoop. There uh, may be. I was actually thinking that from a B2B commerce standpoint, we could talk about this as another tangent, just the relationship side of the business. Um, it's really one-sided right now, kind of with a Salesforce approach. And it would be interesting for someone to come out or if there is a two-sided B2B um, relationship management platform, because there really doesn't seem to be um, today, but that's another tangent. Um, yeah. so, so True Red is experimenting. So that, that's, that's one, one space we're doing it. Um, the other space that we're, we're experimenting is Coastwide, which is our facilities and uh, pack and ship products. Um, we started doing um, uh, some uh, earned media work, getting in publications, because it's a very small um, group of people. Yeah. And I, we're going to basically, you know, getting publications, articles, showcasing our expertise, um, you know, on how to set up a janitorial closet, how to, you know, how to best clean a restroom, advice on cleaning after a pandemic, things like that. And we're just mm -hmm. getting into publications. We're getting tons of traction. So, um, you know, hundreds of qualified leads coming in um, because they're, they're seeing the expertise. The next step is really to take that to, to the social platforms and kind of see what happens. Um, it's a, as an experiment. So, you know, LinkedIn, I think is going to be one that is somewhat interesting <laughs> to see where that goes, if we can get more qualified leads through there. Uh, so we're trying to build out a content program for that and get that going. That'll probably won't happen until next quarter. Um, well, actually it is next quarter now as, as of May. So we're, we're, we're starting the quarter now. So hopefully we get that uh, coordinated. So that one's interesting. And then the last piece I'd say that behaves very different is furniture. Mm -hmm. So furniture is our union and scale brand, and we've done phenomenal through the pandemic. We're excited about everything that we've done. Uh, we just created a new campaign. We haven't launched it yet, uh, but we're very excited to where, where the creative is going. And we're going to really build out the social in, um, and, and, the, and, the new, and a new website in, in, this, in this coming quarter. So I'm really excited about that one because it's so timely right now. And my feeling is that everyone went out and bought a 99 or an $89 chair. And now they've been sitting in it for six to eight months and they're realizing that's not the chair for them <laughs> as yeah, this is right. becoming more of a permanent environment. <laughs> so I think uh, we want to be out, be out there uh, very shortly with, uh, with Yeah, speaking. they're realizing so that. We're going to experiment. Uh, it's worth yeah. it to spend more on a chair. It's like your bed now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're probably going to spend more than $99 on your bed. So Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, that's really interesting um, that you guys are playing in all those spaces. And I think the challenge that I think B2B companies have, and I think where it's just a hard problem to solve, and, and sometimes I think you have to take a little bit of a leap of faith, is that buying in B2B isn't as simple usually. Like it's not as transactional. Wow. And so I think that there's a brand, like you might see the brand 10 times before you buy from them, right? Like people might have seen Trellis or they might, it's not like the first time they see Trellis that they might buy yeah. from us. So I think the social media is obviously a really valuable branding tool, but it's just, it's, it's hard to quantify that and how effective it is at. Yeah. I mean, like I this, think for us, you know. there's, there's transactional, which is, which is fairly easy, but it's also highly competitive, right? Cause it's, yeah. It's, 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 you're competing with Amazon and everybody. Yeah. yeah. So you got transactional, then you have this kind of supported area. That's a little bit more than transactional. 
Um, but it doesn't really require an expert. It kind of requires someone that, you know, might need to customize something or you need technology that kind of helps customize something. Yeah. So you kind of get like a cor- corporate program, layer. like a B2B program or corporate online program. Kind of, kind of. And then there's yeah. kind of this, uh, you know, uh, customized solution, uh, almost project based where I literally have to do work with you to get you yeah. what you need. Like the and facilities like, management where it's like, you need to know their building, there's, yeah, you might need to know all these little works that way. Tech, like we do, we do uh, headsets, unified communications products, mm-hmm. outfit kind of call centers. So that's our next technologies uh, product line, and they like that. You want to really talk to them and understand how they're yeah. outfitted to be able to solve that problem for them. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I I think there's ways to actually. My my philosophy is every app can be kind of. <laughs> it's actually actually would be a great charades thing, but every app can actually be. Uh, modeled by humans, <laughs> yeah. so we can we can actually put people we can actually put people in a position to model at almost any type of application that we would build. <laughs> and I think you can if you can if you think about it that way. Okay, this is the modeling. These are the human behaviors that are happening. How do I how do I technify that? How do I turn that into technology? <laughs> and I think you can you can do that. And, and we're I think that's kind of how we we're kind of going about it right now. Um, we're doing a bit of an analysis in the facility space in particular on. Um, what do we really need from the people perspective and, and how could te- te- technology support that? And I think that's something that we kind of are going to continue to do because these heavy assisted sales, um, you want to make them more predictable and technology can help us do that. Yep. Yep. Uh, so we've kind of covered all the questions indirectly, but I say we go through and, and directly ask them and see if that changes your the, the response okay, a little sure. bit. So let's do um, <laughs> I'll go with the first one, then you you can you could follow up, Tim. So, so how has Staples approached B two B e commerce, and maybe you know uh, how is that you know what has that been like over the last few years? I think you know twenty years ago is yeah, I mean, not, it, not so it, important right now. It's been kind of a wild ride. I mean, when I, when I started at Staples, we were one of the top three uh, e commerce uh, websites. So uh, I remember I that back it, in the day. Yeah, it's changed. It's changed quite a bit. I think. Um, I think part of the reason, you know, we weren't focused on going after consumer is because of the B2B side of the business and the nature of that business. And I think as it's adapted, it's been this weird combination of, you know, going extreme into really B2B focus, more procurement focus to, you know, then being more consumer. And, And now it's all kind of coming together. So people just have an expectation now of the technology that they're going to interact with. It's going to be like what's on their phone. <laughs> so when if that's their expectation, you you kind of have to live up to that bar uh, in order in order to just just compete. Um, I think you know close to half the sales are are uh, I, I don't know what the, the worldwide numbers are, but uh, I know I know generally it's about fifty percent mobile and fifty percent through a through a yeah through a desktop. So- so, you know, it I sounds think- like you guys just to kind of add, you know, summarize, it sounds like you guys are starting to approach B2B e-commerce more similar to how you might have approached B2C commerce in the past. I mean, obviously we talked about these nuances and the complexity of these bigger sales, yes. but it sounds like it's shifting down towards more of that Uber you're, you're it is. kind of already yeah. answered it, but I want to yeah. just directly ask you where it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, like, so, so your crazy. experience and part of the reason is, is you got as businesses, we want to grow with businesses and as businesses grow, the experience can't change. So if you come in through our staples.com platform, when we transition you to Staples Advantage, you don't want to have a completely different experience that then you have to yeah. relearn. So you know, merging them. It's and like, sorry, them, now you got to call me in for every call in every order. Like, <laughs> yeah, or like or I just have to like the, the even simple stuff, like the button for this isn't here anymore. It just slows people down. And like, it's just, why do I have to learn this again? So it's, you really want to merge that experience and it's okay if you have different windows or, or different flavors, um, depending on how your business is. If you have, you know, different lines of business, I think that's fine. But what you want to do is you really want to make sure that, um, you know, you're, you want to maintain that consistency so mm-hmm. your B2B customers can grow with you. Yep. So uh, just this, again, this just came to mind related to this, but what role do your stores play for to B2B, all right? Because I clearly understand what the role is for, you know, B2C in general. Well, what role do your stores play mm, for B2B? That's a good question. Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it's a unique, it's a unique setup. So 
one thing, couple of things you'll see, you really see that um, there is a, there is a B, uh, a B2C kind of component with staples.com and, and the retail business. But the funny thing is, is that when we, when we talk to our customers, they all shop in all of the channels historically, sure. now, maybe not as much, but the biggest enterprise customers still pop into retail. <laughs> and that's just historically how it's been. Now I'm not saying it's, not 90% of them, but you know, there, there is still a, a, a component there. Um, so it is, it's really cross pollinated customers will force an omni channel experience. Um, they will, they just for, they just force it and expect it. And they're just disappointed if that's not the case. Um, so I think we have stuff available only in stores that's on our website that you can buy online and pick up in store, but you can't get it delivered. And, you know, that's not, you know, I understand why the business does it. Like, I'm not saying it's not a bad, a, a bad approach, but I think um, in general, that's not what customers expect. Yeah. They just want seamless. They want to, yeah, potentially get online or maybe they're near the store and they want to pick it up in the store. Like they just want the options. They want all the, the options. Inter- the interesting thing I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm wondering how this is going to go is um, how much is convenience going to cost? And what I mean by that is, if I have a plumbing problem and I need to go to Home Depot, is that part going to cost me more because I can't order it and have it delivered in two or three days because the, the inventory is stocked local and close to me? And I don't see a big issue now, but I'm, I'm interested to see how it kind of continues to evolve of how, how much is that now, you know, in a store that's accessible to me going to be, is that going to start to increase costs? Because, you know, essentially, it's, you know, there's a lot of costs associated with um, you know, running in uh, a brick and mortar. Well, I think I think part of the answer, at least what people are testing out, and you know, again, I'm aware of this from the inside from a few folks, is that they're charging more to ship items from store as mm-hmm. opposed to shipping from some other distribution point, right? So yeah. that mm-hmm. could be exactly the same item, and if you went to the store, it's the same cost as it would be online. However, the shipping is different. Yeah. So that's, that's what there's really going to be. I think there's going to be a lot of nuances to how that kind of materializes. Mm-hmm. And like, we don't have, like, if you just think about in, in the country, you don't have a ton of new brick and mortar retailers right now. We've been in because of the pandemic, because of the, <laughs> the, the shift, everything has been going down. But if you were to set up, a, you know, if you were to set up a brand new brick and mortar operation today, well, what does that look like? Amazon is starting to experiment with this because they understand how important it is. They're doing salons. Did you see the salons <laughs> yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. I do. <laughs> you got to stay on top of these things. Especially yeah. when I feel like there. they're going to get so much business just because they're like, ooh, I want to check out the Amazon salon. You know, like just because like, what <laughs> the heck is this thing? You know? But I think that to me, the thing is, is like it, it, it's, it's really going to be evolving. And like the one that I point to, um, I'm a big fan of Thrive Market. I, I, act, I like mm. how they market themselves. I like, I like their, great. Yeah. their program. I just like how they're, I, I like how everything is positioned and how it's flowing in. Um, and like I said, I try a lot of uh, e-commerce platforms. But if I think about <laughs> what if Thrive set up a store today, would it look like a Whole Foods or would it actually be different? Would it be set up to distribute? And mm. it's, uh, you know, aware in Boston, we have this, uh, Asian food market, the 88 market. And it's almost more like an industrial, like, or, or, or actually like a market um, yeah. where just volume is there and it just moves out of there every day. Yeah. Like, it's like, how does, would it, would it actually be different is something I've been questioning myself about for, for a while now. And I'm, I'm interested to see to someone kind of take on a new approach to, to one of these, uh, one of these stores. Yeah, I mean, it, it, my early years, uh, you know, as our listeners know, were, were in retail, and then I switched to e-com and the first dot-com boom. So I'm kind of one of those guys that's like, you know, I'm thinking what retailers are up to, and I still kept contacts in that world. So it's yeah. a very, very, you know, interesting kind of concept seeing like, you know, people saying, no, you know, I'm done with the retail, I'm going fully e-commerce. And now it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, I want to figure out what the opportunities yeah, I, are there. I think... We, we talked about this a little bit, uh, Tim, offline. Is like, I, I think um, we're going to kind of the reverse. I think online used to support in-store, like Staples mm-hmm. has these stores, and then they're like, oh, the internet, so now we got to make an e-commerce site. And the online was always kind of like a supporting uh, the stores. Mm-hmm. And I think now we're moving to the reverse, where the off yeah. the online is your people get excited, or they see you on social media, they become a user. And then from there 
the stores complement that like Amazon's now building a, a foot a location footprint, you know, like mm -hmm. I think you're seeing more of this uh, stores really be like a, a supplement to the online as to, as it used to be the other way around, you know, I, I agree. I think it's a, you know, there, there's a lot of parallels, like, you know, Disney makes money selling a lot of the movies, but there's only a few physical manifestations, right? There's only, you go to the theme parks, you know, the, yeah. the, there's only, but you, that customer experience and those physical manifestations are, is it important um, yeah. to be able to kind of, um, you know, build that relationship. It buy, mean, builds you into the brand. It really ingrains you into yeah. the brand. Like, and I wouldn't do it. Like clearly it has to be a, to me, it has to be a functional business. You don't just do it to create a brand experience. Yeah. But, yeah. Lose um, a bunch of money. Know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, you could do brand experience showcases at South by Southwest and some of those other uh, great things we used to have. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think it uh, you know, that I think it is important and you have to figure that out. So when you hear about, you know, it, the balance it's it's what is the balance and, and the balance won't be the same for every business i agree you. i agree um, so you got to really figure that out like an outdoor store like rei i mean you probably you're going to want a lot of physical yeah. um, experience to be able to yeah. get people in for sure and engage them. i think i think it like you said it depends entirely on the product if it's like yeah. a, a another, my friend works at gucci i think gucci will have a lot of in-person probably forever because it's i mean maybe if it augmented reality and artificial intelligence is so advanced that you can like put it on your own body that until that happens, I think that kind of crop product when you're spending like a thousand dollars on like a t-shirt or something like that, it's like, you really want to be there for that yeah. experience. And there's a lot of data yeah. to support that too. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm the, uh, the COO of a fashion brand actually, and among other things. And, and it really, all the data that we have is that consumers want to see touch, you know, try, all yeah. that kind of stuff, no matter what the online experience is, whatever happens on social, they're really into that. And it's also true, you know, and again, this is just data I've seen, uh, the the furniture piece that you had mentioned, right? Yeah. That's something that people have talked about over and over and over again. And I've talked to folks at Crate and Barrel, and I know people at yeah. Wayfair, you know, you, they want to see those room setups. And it's not just having like the AR or VR experience. They want to go somewhere and actually see it, like yeah. sit in that chair, try the table out. Same thing for I'm sure for you guys for offices. Right? Yeah, yeah, I'll give you an even I'll give you an even more realistic example. We 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 actually make gaming chairs. It's been a phenomenal success at our retail environment because mm -hmm. we have great experience making chairs you can sit in all day. <laughs> and a lot of these gaming products, um, there was you know there's a design to it, but people don't necessarily sit in them all like they were making them for aesthetic purposes not yeah which is aesthetic. not very useful yeah. if you play like 16 hours a day yeah or, you know, so you know. so we just we were looking we just did a, a furniture review and we're looking at the product we're like well this brand looks just like ours that that's selling why is it you know 10 to 20 dollars less what what's going on here and we're like are we overpriced what's going on we did an audit and the product is way smaller than our product <laughs> it, and it doesn't have you know the same grade material there's a two-year warranty versus <laughs> seven-year warranty and you know one of the things that i've you know i've championed and, and my team is now leading at staples is our is is the you know what we call the product display page content uh, for each individual SKU. and like if i don't put in that first image that it has a seven or second image that it has a, a, has a seven-year warranty you're probably not going to even pick that up in all of the content that's thrown at you these yeah. days. There's so, so much you have to prioritize you, the hierarchy. You, know, you literally can yeah. buy a chair that's probably has twenty dollars more of cost in it for twenty dollars more. <laughs> so from a from a from a benefit to the customer standpoint, you're getting a hell of a lot more chair if you there you know buying the, the the Emerge brand chair and and to pick up on those nuances in the content, it's really really I mean we're pros at this and and we looked at it and we didn't get it from the from the online content. <laughs> we actually had our team buy the chairs and you had, to, them. you had to literally see the chairs. Because yeah, when you're when you're comparing dimensions, like it's like just a rule, like just a number to a number. You're like. Well, does that fit me or not? Like, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You know, so, yeah. so furniture is a particularly difficult place. I think 
Um, we've all, I, I've fallen for it uh, before where you buy uh, something online from a furniture dealer and it's just way smaller than you thought well, it was. Well, it's like Spinal Tap. It's just like yeah. Stonehenge yeah. and Spinal Tap. It's like, you know, is it this big or is it this <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. But I think it, it is a hurdle. I mean, it is going to be a hurdle going forward. And, and it's like, what size chair are you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but people, I think, know, are now know more with clothes. Like, you, you have a good, good chance of exactly. kind of figuring out online because you buy it more frequently. But um, but what I was going with that is I think the more the premium the thing is, the more being in person matters. So I think if you're selling something that's, you know, mid-market or below, it's really important to, to, to do the online. If you're selling kind of the premium products, then maybe, you're, like you said, that that split of uh, in uh, location versus online, I think depends on the like level of. Product. Yeah. It's just, I think you know? just the higher, you know, just, just be careful because the, you don't want to forego the technology that, that is yeah. on the consumer side because customers expect kind of expect it, that at all levels. And, and it might drive the in-person experience too. Like yeah. seeing a cool augmented reality thing of something expensive might make you go to the store to actually go see it. Yeah. You know. There's also a quadrant related thing. And, and again, I wish I could remember where this came from, but it might be Gartner, it might be somebody else. But you know, there's a quadrant related thing for the data where basically it is exactly as Isaiah said about you know how expensive something is, but it's also familiarity. So yeah. if you are super familiar with a very expensive thing, let's say a Tesla or something, you'll just order it online without ever touching it. Right, you just are familiar with it. You'll seventy three thousand dollars. You lose order, right? <laughs> yeah, because you've probably driven in your friend's Tesla. And there's only like eight. There's only like three models. Or exactly. So yeah. people, <laughs> there's like a certain weird like ratio to this stuff. So if people really are used to something or have seen in other settings, and that's another thing about experience. Like if they've seen the office furniture, like in you know every office for you know company X, then they're already familiar with it and they'll just buy it. Right. Yeah. They don't need to go to your store to see it. Yeah, it makes yeah. a lot of sense. That that makes a lot of sense. So I think uh, let's keep keep going. Uh, I asked the last one, uh, Tim. So let, let's see what uh, <laughs> see if it changes the answer. If you ask the next one. <laughs> Wait, what was what was the oh, next so one? Oh, so sorry. You're not. Uh, you're. I forgot that we didn't make the formal document. Oh, so. I didn't even. I did I lost something. Yeah, it's point. it's uh it's how has B two B commerce changed over the years? So uh, yes. uh, all of these we've kind of touched on. I think the, the, yeah. So. Uh, well, the catalog. Well, let, let, let's catalog go. Th- piece. Yeah, let's, let's go through these and then let's see which ones are worth it. So, what do you think uh, should be done to? So, this one I think is uh, the, the last two. I think are more valuable because we talked about how it's changed. Um, so, what do you think uh, businesses should be doing to accelerate the value of B two B commerce? And let's just kind of two part this. Like, how do you see that aligning with sales? Because I think they, they kind yeah. of go hand in hand. Where like I, companies I not kind of hit on you know, it. Yeah, yeah, I think I kind of hit on it already um, in the, you know, it feels like, um, the, you know, at a certain size, at a certain size, um, the, the, it's relationship based, there's relationships that are built to kind of uh, close deals and, and, and um, yeah. move bigger businesses, uh, relationships, and it oftentimes feels one sided, like not two sided. So I'm at Staples, I'm a prospect of somebody that's using Salesforce to sell to me, and they kind of have a relationship management tool on their side to try to you know, build a relationship with me and, and, and sell something yeah. to me. And it's not, you know, I might not need to use them now, but I, if, if it's not something I need now, a lot of times I tell people, ping me back in a quarter or I'll talk to you in yeah, yeah. this time frame. Cause it's up to them to actually it. follow up. Like most people probably won't follow up. Well, I know, I know most people use the tools. So they actually just put in, they're like, Oh great. I know that button. And they just put me in the queue. So yeah. it works out great. But I think for me, you know, on the other side, receiving, if you're someone that is a, a buyer, or if you're someone that, um, mm. you know, as a, how do you manage it on your side and maintain those business relationships? And I think, there, there's a gap there to me from a from a B2B perspective of, you know, is it always on the seller's role to, to maintain them? But how, how can I keep that in order and in a queue um, to kind of come back to those? So when if I'm looking up for you, if I if I do decide to look for your service and you've already prospected me, how can I find you? And, and you know, trying to make, yeah, one way is marketing it, but it's almost like, okay, this person has a brand strategy in your title. 
or brand, you know, in, in your LinkedIn uh, skill sets. Therefore, I could go in there and find services that, you know, for, for people that might provide that service um, and, and kind of then rel manage relationships through there somehow. But I, I just feel like that it's not two sided. And I feel like that's really difficult um, because it's, it's always relying on the seller to be the best at it, I guess. And sometimes I, I'll tell you, you know, I've, um, you know, I've bought things for people marketing to me, but we just did a huge um, RFP for uh, content, uh, PDP image services, the people that create the carousel images. Mm -hmm. We interviewed 12 companies and um, there, there aren't many people that specialize in it. I can, I can tell you that right now. Many people <laughs> said they did. Um, and, you know, not like to try to find that service is, is really hard. So unless someone's trying to sell it to me, um, there isn't a lot of great avenues to try to go go get, you know, and, and find the best in class. So I'm, I just feel like there's something to be said because these are large purchases. Um, they're, they're big investments for businesses and there doesn't seem to be a lot of great tools on, on both ends. Mm. So I guess what, you know, if you were, you know, maybe earlier in the journey, because you guys are probably a little bit further than the average B2B company, you know, Talk, think about all the smaller companies that barely have any, any e-commerce um, or B2B, or maybe they have some, but it's only 10% or a small percentage of their business. What I, what I think we see happening um, at these companies is they're struggling because sales in some way sees it as a threat or they don't know how to, you know, complement their skill set with the new technology that they might add to the business e-commerce. So like, how would you, advise you know uh, let's say it's a new business unit of staples in there which you do actually deal with and they have salespeople. but now you're bringing on the online component and the sales people like oh crap am i gonna like lose my job or like have you guys seen that or you do you like yeah what would you what would you advise <laughs> well i mean i think it, it it's it's never going to be all all of one so it's it's always to me it's always going to be some sort of a, a hybrid model so yep. if, you're, if you're starting out and you're doing b2b sales and you're you know adding technology should be really related to some sort of scaling plan then you actually need that technology to be able to scale and the technology is 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 likely what's going to get you to be profitable because if adding people was going to get you to be profitable where you wanted to be you wouldn't you would just add the people and you wouldn't need the technology probably. So yeah. I think it's really, it's kind of, it's hard to say universally how it works, but I think for me, my perspective is that it's, I always think it's going to be a hybrid approach in, mm -hmm. um, in the B2B space. I just think it's, I'm not saying it always has to be, um, you know, a hundred percent that way, but I think you have, it has to be an option. So I, yeah. I think the example um, uh, that that Tim provided of Tesla, yeah, there's a there's an online way to buy it, but there's also another way to buy it where you can actually talk to humans, and it doesn't it doesn't so don't don't you know you kind of got to do both, and then you got to figure out the relationship between the two and yeah. all of the, all of the pickups you know and drop offs and the handshakes in between to make sure that it, it's really seamless. It's not two different experiences. Yeah. I think that's, so they that's need to be working together. That's kind of my point is I think they really sales and the, the technology need to work together. And yeah. And I, I don't, I just don't see any other way of, of doing it at, at this point. Now technology might change to a point where, where that's possible. Um, yeah. But I think right now, I think you want to make sure you're, you're doing both. The other thing is that, you know, depending on how the business is and how, what they sell, you know, I, I know my, my brother-in-law works, uh, he's worked in, um, uh, uh, kind of high tech industries that map the ocean floor for his entire career <laughs> wow. and it's either software or devices. And some of the devices they sell, you know, they're a couple hundred thousand dollars. He sells in North America, you know, 15, 20 in a year. So those deals to say that that's going to just be technology because someone like no. it's all built yeah. on multi-year relationships and things like that, that, you know, so I think you just really have to understand what, what you're selling and, and, and what, how you're going to do it. Now, I will tell you that he uses some phenomenal technology of in, an integrated sales platform that's integrated with, um, you know, technology and product management platform that, that you know, works on product updates. And it, it's all real life. As he's collecting data on the sales side, it's feeding into the product development pipeline and wow. they're adapting and shifting products so that as the needs and, and, and software changes, their, their products are basically being updated wow. 
based on all his interactions, which is pretty fantastic. That's pretty That's amazing. Pretty, um, yeah. So like, there's ways to do this, and but and and and, and essentially, um, you know make money from that relationship <laughs> because it's advancing your product line, you know, while you're, you know, building the relationship to make the, the so, sale. Actually. So really the simplest answer is just, you need to figure out how technology will, will assist sales. And that could be, you know, automating orders and scaling orders because it, it might help with that process and people want to self-serve. Yeah. So, you know, if you're competing against Amazon self-serve and you don't do a good job, you're probably going to lose a lot of sales. But as you get up the funnel of like complexity, it's probably going to change. Like you, you get into that corporate yeah. accounts, that procurement, uh, like the the middle level, and then you go even further with like these big machine. Let's say you're saying, like you said, like a selling a two hundred thousand dollar machine. You're yeah. probably going to talk to someone. You're probably not likely to just click a button. Yeah, but then, online. but but yeah. when you have that person there, figure out how you can monetize what they're doing. So if yes. I'm having constant yeah. conversations with people that are that are buying either even if they don't buy my equipment figure out what they bought, what were the features of what they bought yeah. and feeding that back into the pipeline yeah. so that your, your products are, so it's not a, it's not a, it's not a lost sale. It's gained intelligence. Or maybe so a demo video, that. or I spent all my days doing demos of this thing, like at least make it a video and you can send the video. Exactly. And it, that's exactly that, yeah, something he would do all the time is do yeah. these big demos, rent a boat, go out and show off the yeah. equipment. Um, so, you know, these are the types of things you have to think about. And I think it's, you know, that's an extreme version. And I like extreme examples because I think extremes are kind of the way you test, you yeah. test the, the parameters uh, of like, the parameters this, of where, where, yeah. you might <laughs> where it's going to break down. Like, can it, can it handle the extreme? Exactly. I always, <laughs> I love testing. I love going to the extremes and saying, this is the edge of this. So I think you have completely, you know, I mean, now I, I haven't gone grocery shopping in probably five years. I, I don't go. Like, really? I, I, I was one of the first people to go. I'm impressed. Food. I'm actually really impressed. I, I, I mean, I like the and I like the grocery <laughs> store. So, like, I love the I love going. Like when I'm when I have time, like my wife would always say, like I say, I'll go to the store. She's like, oh, right, three hours later, you'll be back with all this stuff that I don't know what to do with. <laughs> and I like to cook, so I make all random stuff. So I would buy new stuff and make new meals. But um, you know, I I think. There, there's ways that this will, you know, as the technology adapts, customers get used to certain things, uh, certain areas will continue to change and it'll be, um, you just have to kind of stay, stay on pace and, and make sure you're, you're uh, you know, advancing as the, as the world changes. So one more change question, you know, as we wrap up. So, you know, obviously we've all been through uh, a lot over the last year plus because of, uh, you know, COVID and a lot of people working from home and work from anywhere. You know, what do you really see as some of the lasting, just a couple of the lasting changes? Yeah. Because I've talked with folks about that, you know, from so many different angles. So what do you think like five years from now is going to be a lasting change out of this moment? And let's assume in five years that, we actually are, there is not much risk. <laughs> we no, can, yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. yeah, I've had my, I've had my, uh, um, my perspective grounded from pretty much the beginning. I, I've said from the beginning, it'll never be the same, uh, significantly never be the same. So I don't actually believe we're, 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 we're going back to uh, an, an area that uh, was exactly the way that it was before. Um, I think what people learned a lot is what really matters to them. Uh, through this experience, and I think um, they're they're deciding on, on what they want to do. Um, so I think people have been able to flex and work from home, and um, they've seen their family more. Yeah. I, I have an associate that said I can have dinner with my family because I don't commute so long. Well, that person's never going to exchange that again. Yeah, um, now that they realize how important it is. I've also seen people that have struggled, and um, they're highly social, and they they just are um, really struggling to just. Uh, make co connections with people, yeah, um, and and figuring out how to do that uh, in uh, in the Northeast when it when it gets so frozen here, yeah, um, it's really it's difficult. It's not great to be like, hey, it's you know, let's become friends <laughs> on Zoom. You're my new um, uh, Zoom best. But friend. overall, I, yeah, I think overall, what I think what I'm seeing is that it's going to be a hybrid work environment. Um, there's no, there's no, there's no other way about it. There, it yeah. One, it's just not efficient. Um, it's not efficient. It's not environmentally sound to to make people drive somewhere if a job can be can be done um, yeah. without going there. Um, from a from a digital standpoint, I just think we've advanced uh, in in e-commerce. I think it just accelerated everything. 
Um, you've probably read the articles. Uh, you know, some say five, some say ten, some say uh, more than ten. Uh, I'm gonna go with five. I'm gonna go with five. <laughs> yeah, I think it accelerated us. Um, you know, uh, quite a few years, uh, and I think we've we've seen the future. And I, I don't think it's that scary. Uh, I think people are are adapting and 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 uh, evolving with it. I do think that there's just infrastructure that needs to be um, you know built to, in order to kind of continue to support yeah. it. Um, and then I think there's going to be this rush back to being social as much as we can. It may not, I was never one where there's kind of this rush. I'm more of a, it's going to be one of these and it's going to just, well, it's not going to be this big wow moment. It's going to be this trickling back of things. And um, I think it'll trickle back and it'll continue to evolve. But I, I absolutely think people are going to see, you know, going out in public as a risk. Um, uh, and maybe you're not going to, um, uh, have such a uh, adverse uh, reaction um, if you do uh, if you've been vaccinated, but uh, I think it's still going to be a continued risk, and people are going to still really protect themselves. Uh, I just don't think people are going to um, uh, you know be as uh, open, I guess, as, as they were able to be before. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess for me, I I, I don't want to be a pessimist. I, I don't want to be <laughs> uh, labeled that way, but I, I just think it, it's it's really changed people's lives, yeah. and I think. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I think cities are going to, you know, see a, 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 a rush to return. And then I think it's going to go back a little bounce back and forth. Um, you know, I, I even if let's say, just say that there's zero health risk. I agree that I personally think that now that people realize, hey, if you can get work done from home and it's the same level of productivity of not going to home, it's kind of a win win. Your employees are probably happier because they don't spend a bunch of time commuting. They save an hour or two a day, whatever, um, and they save money on gas. And so, and I think the big thing that people are underestimating, especially, and we figured this out way before the pandemic, is that Trellis probably wouldn't exist today if we hadn't gone remote because the talent, you know, Boston is an expensive place to hire, right? Yeah. And it was really limiting. And it's especially hard to hire good technical talent because we're competing with like all these massive tech yeah. companies and so we're like you know what let's find let's go remote and or let's see what we find we just experimented and over time we realized hey like we can get really good developers and random parts in the country for a lot cheaper that might even be better than people we'd find in boston you know and yeah. so i think once companies kind of adapt to that it's such a competitive advantage why would why would you go back i do i do think the office has value we're not getting rid of it our does office. yeah so I, mean, I look at it like this. So I, it, there's two, two factors. It's time and place. Yeah. So is your work time bound? Does it matter if you get it done between nine and five? Is it flexible? Can it be done anytime? Does it matter if it's done not between nine and five? So I kind of look at it as kind of a, a, yeah. a quadrant of time like bound, that. completely yeah. not time bound. And then place. Does place matter for my work? Now, place to me changes throughout your career. So, and, and what you're, and it's the type of work and where you are in your career. If you're new to a business, you got to get, you, you're, you're going to be experiencing that company. So you got to be in a place where you can experience the company and surround yourself and get to know people as much as possible. And, and quite frankly, that happens faster. Um, if you're, if you're in the same space where you can uh, share casual conversations more easily and things like that, but primarily there's work that is better in a specific place highly technical work, but there's large pieces of equipment that you need to do it with. Collaboration works better uh, in an in a, in a individual space. But overall, it's those two factors that you really, to me, and there's more, I, I, you know, there's more to our detail, but that's what you really yeah. have to figure out. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of factors. Group. There's a lot of factors. Yeah. yeah. I think my, my wife does uh, interior design uh, for large companies. Uh, I don't want to name all the, all the brands, <laughs> but a lot of brands that you would know uh, and businesses that you would know in Massachusetts. And uh, I can tell you pretty much every one of them is, is downscaling their physical space um, and not giving space to, to everybody. Um, they only have certain days a week that they can come in. They're, they're literally reducing their footprints um, because they, they've seen, they wouldn't do it if they felt like it wasn't working. <laughs> so they've seen a, a productivity um, benefit from, from doing that. And they're not saying you can't you know, come into the office um, ever, but they're saying, look, your job, you know, um, based on our analysis is three days a week in the office. And that's your uh, time that you have available to have um, some space in the office for, for what you need to do. Um, and, and not everyone is that way, but 
for the majority of them, you know, we were where everyone was worried about jobs. And uh, when this first hit, I'm sure. And uh, her response was, well, everyone building now has to resize or rescale or shift. So <laughs> you know, she's still moving, you know, offices and spaces around. And I think, you know, it's interesting though, like they're, um, as the consistent themes are really downscale physical space and, and more flexibility. Uh, is really kind of the two the two themes that you could just say are yeah oh and the other thing is cleaning um and finding people to clean during <laughs> the day versus in the evening so i know we all experience like the evening cleaners that kind of came in and cleaned yeah, them. Yeah. you know in order to build confidence most many businesses are trying to find cleaning stuff to clean in the during the day so that people have confidence that the space is clean uh, and safe uh, and so it's a, these, there's some really nuanced changes that we're, I think we're going to see. It's an entire new, uh, I, I, I spoke with somebody about this, as, uh, believe it or not, and it's a, it really created this entire new workforce because, yeah. you know, as you said, most offices and other places did not have any of those folks. You know, even hospitals, for example, they would come in like at night when it was quiet or visit yeah. visiting hours were over, all of it changed. And they had to get entirely new crews and, you know, lots more job opportunity, actually. Yeah. I mean, I think you're, you're going to see, it, it's definitely going to be, it, it's definitely going to be visible and, and it's definitely going to be evolved. I mean, I think the reaction during the pandemic, I still uh, remember like they took garbage cans away so people wouldn't touch them, but <laughs> where are you going to put the garbage? You got to get those back out there and then you got to have to have a way just to throw it out the window. That's what yeah. I mean. You just have to figure out a way to solve the problem. So there, there's just a number of things I think that are, that are going to happen. But um, overall, it's, uh, you know, I think for, for my, my experience with, with working uh, remotely, I think we've been, uh, I think we've been really successful. I think, you know, we deal a lot with physical products um, and evaluating those. Um, that's a bit of a struggle. The FedEx and UPS and uh, uh, bills are a little bit higher from moving samples <laughs> around to different people. Um, but but you know, now that we can go back in the office and, and a lot of people feel more comfortable about that, that, that is really the major burden, I think for us was being able to physically see product, look at it set um, uh, on a wall, do sorting and things like that, uh, analyze a series of prototypes, um, that kind of thing, because they're, they're physical objects and, and you really need to do that. So that's probably the, the main thing that um, was well, for us. I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, invite you to uh, another edition of our podcast in 2026 and you could arrive yeah. in your flying car. <laughs> yeah. and talk all about, you know, what's well, my theory is now my, it's, I, it's it, we're probably still on the steady up of uh, getting yeah. through this. <laughs> Yeah, well, we would love to have you back. We we just had our first repeat guest, and it was really exciting. And it was um, so yeah, we'd love to have you back. What was interesting with him is that he uh, during the pandemic when we interviewed him, he was a hundred percent. He had converted a hundred percent online because they couldn't really do in person. They had to adapt very quickly. It was very impressive, and they're a small business. And then now he's saying he's seeing a nice mix of fifty fifty. Online still really important, but there are those people that are like, I need to come to the showroom. I need to see it. I need to know what I'm buying and there's that mix. So that's cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think we've, uh, honestly, it, it's, uh, it's good to see, um, you know, most of, most of, uh, the, you know, the, the employment numbers, you know, fairly yeah. strong and see progress. So I think, you know, hopefully we can kind of continue to sustain this and, uh, we get some, uh, you know, improvement in, um, you know, uh, the, the health, uh, the general public's health and, uh, keep, keep cranking. I think we will. I think we will. But yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I think we we'll probably keep talking for a couple hours here. <laughs> and I know you got a whole great. a lot of stuff to do, so we really appreciate it. Thanks. Well, it was nice, nice meeting you, Tim and Isaiah. Thanks as always. Yeah, absolutely. Thank it's you. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Take it easy, guys.